Episode 14. Dark clouds lurk through unsuspecting backyards. Not dogs in the bushes breathe shallowly. Don't believe your eyes. Greetings and welcome in to the Patuxent General, your spot for info, drinks, recipes, and ghost stories, all things Patuxent-ish. This week is comforting for midwinter. Quiche is our recipe. We have a French pear martini and the continuing series of the case of Charles Dexter Ward. But first, we would like to thank all of our Patreon subscribers, without whom we are nothing. So, please think about joining our Patuxent Village townies and receive special content, local photos, and copies of our recipes. So please, give a little. It helps a lot. Now, on to the quiche and nothing but the quiche. When I was 13 years old, the psychic fair came to Roads on the Patuxet. I did not know what that meant until I was there. It was enough that my mother explained that we were going and that we would be selling quiche and Perrier. Did I mention 1980? We would be making 30 quiche, and she would work on the filling while I made the crusts. And I did. All 30. We finished the last ones together and packed them chilled into large Coleman ice chests. We sold them whole and by the slice, quick enough to let me spend a little well-earned cash at the festival. The atmosphere was magical. People meditating on the stage and on the floor. Delicious smells and sparkling crystals mark the day for me. And quiche, here is mine. You will need one regular size quiche pan. If yours is larger, double the recipe for crust and cut off the extra. You will need one third of a cup of butter, cold chopped very small. Uh, do this by hand. One cup flour, a little extra to roll with. Four tablespoons very cold water. Mix in mixer or by hand. Either way, be gentle. Now you can roll this out between two plastic sheets or on a nice wide fancy table or on your quiche pan turned upside down. Uh, this way it always fits. A little bit of flour keeps it from sticking, then roll it off, flip the pan, and pat it in. Easy peasy. Fork it a little bit, and stick it in the oven at 350 for 7 minutes. For the filling, you will need 2 cups shredded Gruyere and Swiss, 5 eggs, 2 and a half cups of milk, 4 slices of uncured bacon, chopped and browned, 1 leek, just the soft white parts, sautéed in salt and pepper. In the bacon pan, silly! Put bacon, then leeks, then cheese in the bottom of the crust, then cover with milk and egg wet mix. Bake in a 350 degree oven for about 40 minutes or until it is golden all around the edge and bounces back. Try to meditate on something sparkly to distract you from having to wait for it to cool for a bit. And enjoy. This week's drink is from a local spot. Light, sparkling, and full of flavor. A perfect complement for a slice of quiche or perhaps a cup of onion soup. For this drink, you will need... One ounce of pear-flavored vodka. One third of an ounce St. Germain elderflower liqueur. Sparkling wine, your preference. First rim a chilled martini glass with sugar. Fill a cocktail shaker full of ice, then the vodka and the elderflower. Shake. Strain into a martini glass, and then fill with sparkling wine. Have it at home, or one to order at the Chandler at the Cliff Walk in Newport, Rhode Island. Enjoy. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his Electromagnetic Pinball Museum and Restoration Arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. This week's episode of the House of the Corner series is the continuing reading of The Case of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft. So settle in and let's get started. Chapter 3 
In 1766 came the final change in Joseph Kerwin. It was very sudden and gained wide notice amongst the curious townsfolk. For the air of suspense and expectancy dropped like an old cloak, giving instant place to an ill-concealed exaltation of perfect triumph. Kerwin seemed to have difficulty in restraining himself from public harangues on what he had found or learned or made. But apparently the need for secrecy was greater than the longing to share his rejoicing for no explanation was ever offered by him. It was after this transition, which appears to have come early in July, that the sinister scholar began to astonish people by his possession of information which only their long-dead ancestors would seem to be able to impart. But Kerwin's feverish secret activities by no means ceased with this change. On the contrary, they tended rather to increase, so that more and more of his shipping business was handled by the captains whom he now bound to him by ties of fear as potent as those of bankruptcy had been. Every possible moment was spent on the Patuxet farm, although there were rumors now and then of his presence in places which, though not actually near graveyards, were so yet situated in relation to graveyards that thoughtful people wondered just how thorough the old merchant's change of habits really was. As for Whedon, though his periods of espionage were necessarily brief and intermittent on the account of his sea voyaging, had a vindictive persistence which the bulk of his practical township and uh, farmers lacked, and it subjected Kerwin's affairs to a scrutiny such as they had never had before. Many of the odd maneuvers of the strange merchant's vessels had been taken for granted on account of the unrest of the times, when every colonist seemed determined to resist the provisions of the Sugar Act, which hampered a prominent traffic. Smuggling and evasion were a rule in Narragansett Bay, and nocturnal landings of illicit cargoes were continuous commonplaces. But Whedon, night after night following the lighters or small sloops which he saw steal off from the Kerwin warehouses in the Town Street docks, soon felt assured that it was not merely His Majesty's armed ships that the sinister skulker was anxious to avoid. The lighters grew wont to put out from the black, silent docks, and this time they would go down the bay some distance, perhaps as far as Namquid Point, where they would meet and receive cargo from strange ships of considerable size and widely varied appearance. Kerwin's sailors would then deposit this cargo at the usual point on the shore and transport it overland to the farm, locking in the same cryptical stone building which had formerly received prisoners. The cargo consisted almost wholly of boxes and cases, of which a large proportion were oblong and heavy and disturbingly suggestive of coffins. Whedon always watched the farm with unremittent absurdity, visiting it each night for long periods, and seldom letting a week go by without a sight, except when the ground bore a footprint revealing snow. Even then, he would often walk as close as possible on traveled road or on the ice of the neighboring river to see what tracks others may have left. Finding his own vigils interrupted by nautical duties, he hired a tavern companion named Eleazar Smith to continue the survey during his absence, and between the two could have set in motion some extraordinary rumors. That they did not do so was because they knew the effect of publicity would have to warn their quarry and make further progress impossible. Instead, they wished to learn something definite before taking any action. What they did learn must have been startling indeed. And Charles Ward spoke many times to his parents of his regret at Whedon's later burning of his notebooks. All that can be told of their discoveries is that Eleazar Smith jotted down in a non-too-coherent diary and what other diarists and letter writers have timidly repeated from his statements, which they finally made and according to which the farm was only the outer shell of some vast and revolting menace, of a scope and depth too profound and intangible for more than shadowy comprehension. It was gathered that Whedon and Smith became early convinced that a great series of tunnels and catacombs, inhabited by a very sizable staff of persons besides the old man and his wife, underlay the farm. 
The house was an old peaked relic of the middle 17th century with enormous stacked chimney and diamond-paned lattice windows, the laboratory being in a lean-to towards the north, where the roof came nearly to the ground. This building stood clear of any other. Yet judging by the different voices heard at odd times within, it must have been accessible through secret passages beneath. These voices before 1766 were mere mumblings and whisperings and frenzied screams, uh, coupled with curious chants and invocations. After that date, however, they assumed a very singular and terrible cast as they ran the gambit betwixt dronings of dull acquiescence and explosions of frantic pain or fury, rumblings of conversations and whines of entreaty, pantings of eagerness and shouts of protest. They appeared to be in different languages, all known to Kerwin, whose rasping accents were frequently distinguishable in reply, reproof or threatening. Sometimes it seemed that several persons must be in the house, Kerwin, certain captives, and the guards of those captives. There were voices of a sort that neither Whedon nor Smith had ever heard, despite their wide knowledge of foreign parts and many that they did not seem to place as belonging to this or that nationality. The nature of the conversations seemed like a kind of catechism, as if Kerwin were extorting some sort of information from terrified or rebellious prisoners. Eden had many verbatim reports of overheard scraps in his notebook for English, French, and Spanish, which he knew, but of these nothing has survived. He did, however, say that besides a few ghoulish dialogues in which the past affairs of Providence family were concerned, most of the questions and answers he could understand were historic or scientific, occasionally pertaining to very remote places and ages. Once, for example, an alternately raging and sullen figure was questioned in French about the Black Prince's massacre in Le Mans in 1370, as if there was some hidden reason which he ought to know. Kerwin asked the prisoner, if prisoner he were, whether the order to slay was given because of the sign of the goat found on the altar in the ancient Roman crypt beneath the cathedral, or whether the dark man of the hot vein was spoken at the three words. Failing to obtain replies, the inquisitor had seemingly retorted to extreme means, for there was a terrible shriek, followed by silence, and mutterings, and a bumping sound. None of these colloquies were ever oculally witnessed, since the windows were always heavily draped. Once, though, during a discourse in an unknown tongue, a shadow was seen at the curtain, which startled Whedon exceedingly, reminding him of one of the puppets in a show he had seen in the autumn of 1764 in Hasher's Hall, when a man from Germantown, Pennsylvania, had a clever mechanical spectacle, advertised as... A view of the famous city of Jerusalem, in which are represented Jerusalem, the Temple of Solomon, his royal throne, the noted towers, the hills, likewise the suffering of our Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane, to the cross on the hill of Golgotha. An artful piece of statuary, worthy to be seen by the curious. It was on this occasion that the listener, who had crept close to the window in the front room, hence where the speaking proceeded, gave a start, which rose the old pair, and caused them to lose the dogs on him. After that, no conversations were ever heard in the house, and Whedon and Smith concluded that Kerwin had transferred his field of action to the regions below. That such regions in truth existed seemed amply clear from many things. Faint cries and moans unmistakably come up now and then from what appeared to be solid earth in places far from any structure, whilst hidden in the bushes along the river bank in the rear, where the high ground sloped steeply to the valley of the Patuxet, there was found an arched oaken door in the frame of heavy masonry, which was obviously an entrance to the caverns on the hill. When or how these catacombs could have been constructed, Whedon was unable to say. But he frequently pointed out how easily the place might have been reached by hands of unseen workmen from the river. Joseph Kerwin put his seamen to diverse uses indeed. 
During the heavy spring rains of 1769, the two watchers kept a sharp eye on the steep riverbank and were rewarded by the sight of a profusion of both human and animal bones in places where deep gullies had been worn in the banks. Naturally, there may be many explanations of such things in the rear of a stock farm and a locality where native burying grounds were common, but Whedon and Smith drew their own inferences. It was January 1770, whilst Whedon and Smith were still debating vainly on what, if anything, to think or do about the whole bewildering business, that the incident of the Fort Zalia occurred. Exasperated by the burning of the revenue sloop Liberty at Newport this previous summer, the customs fleet under Admiral Wallace had adopted an increased vigilance concerning strange vessels, and on this occasion His Majesty's armed schooner Signet, under Captain Charles Leslie, captured after a short pursuit one early morning the scow Fort Zalia of Barcelona, Spain, under Captain Manuel Aruda bound accordingly to its log from Grand Cairo, Egypt to Providence. When searched for contraband material, this ship revealed the astonishing fact that its cargo consisted exclusively of Egyptian mummies consigned to sailor ABC, who would come to remove his goods in a lighter just off Namquid Point, and whose identity Captain Aruda felt himself in honor bound not to reveal. The Vice Admiralty at Newport, at a loss what to do in view of the non-contraband nature of the cargo on the one hand, and the unlawful secrecy of the entry on the other hand, compromised on Collector Robinson's recommendation by freeing the ship but forbidding it a port in Rhode Island waters. There were later rumors of it having been seen in Boston Harbor though not openly entered into the port of Boston. This extraordinary incident did not fail of wide remark in Providence. There were not many who doubted the existence of some connection between the cargo of mummies and a sinister Joseph Kerwin. His exotic studies and his curious chemical importations being common knowledge and his fondness for graveyards being common suspicion, it did not take much imagination to link him with a freakish importation, which could not conceivably have been destined for anyone else in town. As if conscious of this natural belief, Kerwin took care to speak casually on several occasions of the chemical nature of the bombs found in mummies, thinking perhaps he might make the affair seem less unnatural, yet stopping just short of admitting his participation. Whedon and Smith, of course, felt no doubt whatsoever of the significance of the thing, and indulged in the wildest theories concerning Kerwin and his monstrous labors. The following spring, like that of the year before, had heavy rains, and the watchers kept careful track of the riverbank behind the Kerwin farm. Large sections were washed away, and a certain number of bones discovered, but no glimpse was afforded of any actual subterranean chambers or burrows. Something was rumored, however, that at the village of Patuxet, about a mile below, where the river flows and falls over a rocky terrace to join a placed landlocked cove. There, where quaint old cottages climbed up the hill from a rustic bridge, fishing smacks lay anchored at their sleepy docks. A vague report went round of things that were floating down the river and flashing into sight for a minute as they went over the falls. Of course, the Patuxet is a long river, which winds through many settled regions abounding in graveyards. And of course, the spring rains had been very heavy. But the fisher folk about the bridge did not like the wild way that one of the things stared as it shot down to the still waters below, or the way that another cried out although its condition was greatly departed from that of objects that which normally cry out. That rumor sent Smith, for Whedon was just then at sea, in haste to the riverbank beyond the farm, where surely enough there remained the evidence of an extensive cave-in. There was, however, no trace of a passenger into the steep bank, for the miniature avalanche had left behind a solid wall of mixed earth and shrubbery from aloft. Smith went to the extent of some experimental digging but was deterred by lack of success, or perhaps by fear of possible success. It is interesting to speculate on what the persistent and revengeful Whedon would have done if he had been ashore at that time. 
Thank you again for joining us here at the PG. If you have a suggestion, question, or dare I say ghost story, our email is jess at patuxetgeneral.com. We would love to hear from you. But until then, I will meet you back here at the Patuxet General. A Something for Posterity production. Pre-recorded in Patuxet. Thank you.